And you are now live. Thank you, Aisha. Welcome, everyone, to uh, today's FBS chat with Dr. Russ Sabella, all the way from, uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's sunny California, Russ. <laughs> oh. we're, we're, we're having snow at the moment, so I'm assuming Is you're... Is that right? Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No snow uh, here. And uh, my co-host, the lovely Grainer, from Bath in the UK. Bristol. Uh, Bristol. 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 <laughs> Close to Bath. It's close to Bath, yeah. Yeah, it begins with the same letter. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like we always do when we first start these chats, Russ, really um, intrigued how you came across that solution-focused approach in the first place and, and what drew you to it, what yeah. made you carry on with it. That's Russ. Sure, that's a good question. And thank you guys for inviting me. Thanks for being here. Um, I uh, I discovered, and I remember it really well. I write about this in the book. I, I discovered the... Um, uh, a book I read, a friend of mine referred it to me. I think I was in graduate school at the time. It was early 90s. And uh, it was called In Search of Solutions by Michelle Weiner Davis and Bill O'Hanlon. And um, I, I was really intrigued. I, I'm probably almost blown away. I thought uh, as someone who always embraced empowerment and looking at uh, strengths and resources and opportunities, uh, this was a little different than the behaviorism and some of the other more problem-centered approaches that I was following. And uh, at the time, I was not only uh, in doc school, but I was a school counselor. And and so um, as I started to look more and more into the solution-focused approach, and remember now at the time, uh, this was being developed by for marriage and family therapists, for mental health therapists, uh, substance abuse counselors really then started using it but it was really not something that school counselors or education was really looking at. And so as a school counselor, I thought, hmm, you know, this, this is really something I want to look into. So it took me a while. Um, and then it was around 1995 when I finished my doctorate. My first professor job was at the University of Louisville. I uh, met a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Jerry Scalaire, and turns out he was also very, very interested in this model. So he got a grant and that's what we did for almost four years. We spent every Friday uh, in several different schools, K through 12, answering two questions. Does the model work with kids? And will it work in an educational setting? And sure enough, we, we did a lot of tweaking. We did a lot of developing. And again, that was uh, started in 95. So here we are, 2021. Uh, we've had uh, over two and a half decades uh, to really develop lots of research. Uh, and uh, uh, the book really has been a quarter century in the making, really. And so I, I finally decided it's time to take a dive. And we've, we've really experienced and developed so many practical applications of this. And really, it's the first book that uh, cuts across an entire school counseling program. It's not just for individual counseling. This is a model that uh, works, whether you're a parent, a supervisor, uh, an organizational developer, or a business leader. Uh, it's, it's a model of positive change. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So um, before you discovered the approach, how, how did your, and obviously you, you, you fell in love with it and thought this may work in the school setting or it, with school counselling. Um, what was it in particular that thought, you know what, this, this, is, this, is, this is a no-brainer, I've got to try yeah. this. Well, and to be honest with you, I, uh, Joe, I'm, I'm not sure it was a no-brainer. You know, I, at the mm. time, I was uh, I was doing what a lot of educators were doing. We were be using behaviorism, really looking at how to reward and increase the frequency and intensity of student behaviors, and come up with schedules of reinforcement. and And I knew that took a lot of work, and I, I knew that there might be a better way out there. But I, I wasn't quite sure. I was I was maybe like some of you, I was a little bit skeptical at first, you know, could it be that we could help kids and families without really ever delving into what causes their problems or the history of their biopsychosocial history of their problems? And so at first I was too was skeptical. I had to see it for myself. And it was during those four years every Friday where that's what I was able to do. I was able to, uh, to be able to see just how empowering it was. And, and one of the things that that we uh, you know, were able to overcome was this idea that maybe this was a Band-Aid approach, that perhaps uh, you know, if you really truly don't uh, look at problems, then you're destined to repeat them. 
And what we discovered, and we collected some data on this, is that uh, no, these results last, and they last no longer or shorter than the other approach. And what we did learn was that if you uh, that we were kind of using the wrong terminology, that you were you were not doomed to repeat your past. We were trying to get people to repeat their past. It was just the wrong focus. That in their past, uh, kids and families had a lot of strengths and resources and opportunities but we weren't focusing on them. We were focusing on the dramas and the traumas. And so once we made the paradigm shift, we were able to get more of what we focused on and uh, we saw great results. And, um, uh, and Russ, so did, um, did you get feedback from teaching staff and, uh, and, and the school from the results that you were finding, as well as obviously yourself seeing a difference each time uh, you'd see your students? Yeah. Yeah, great. That's a great question. Uh, we did get, uh, you know, just like, uh, well, we couldn't have expected it at the time, but today, knowing what we know now, uh, it was to be expected. We had some people who were delighted with the results, others who looked at the results in a very skeptical way. How is it that I've been working with this kid for, you know, a year, and then you're able to get some things done that I couldn't get done in a year in a matter of a week or two? And that was troubling for them. And I write about that in the book, how it is we overcame some of that stuff. Um, and then we had some who were just simply delighted and didn't question it. So it was a real mixed bag, mixed reaction. And still today, you know, as I do trainings uh, for all kinds of uh, counselors, um, we still have people who walk in the door a little bit skeptical as to how this could work because the problem centered approach has been so ingrained in us, you know. Um, and in fact, I get people who come in who say, oh, I'm already solution focused, you know, and, and, you know, I'm just, I kind of hope that they're going to learn some things uh, throughout the day. And they're the ones who come up to me afterwards and say, oh my gosh, I've learned so much. And I say, well, but didn't you say you came in, you said you're already solution focused. And, and what we discovered, and this is one of the myths of the model, which I write about right up front in the book, is that uh, people get those two things confused. Um, just because you come out with goals, doesn't mean that you're solution focused. Um, you can be problem centered and still have goals, but the two pathways are very different. So going, taking a problem centered pathway, as you know, is very different than taking the solution focused pathway. What you focus on, the kinds of questions you ask, um, what it is you especially you don't focus on, uh, all of that matters in this model. Mm. So do you train teachers as well as other counselors are you working kind of inherently in in schools in that way like a whole school approach well you know I, when i can get the chance to do that right now i'm focusing mostly on school counselors and quite a bit of a uh, few mental health counselors as well um my uh i do uh i encourage principals to include teachers whenever they can uh, and by the way i've done full day workshops just for principals who, uh, who really incorporate the ideas in how it is that they manage, govern, um, as well as uh, empower their employees, the whole staff, you know, to really be on track and, and, and meet mm -hmm. their potential. Um, one of the things that's on my to-do list uh, that I really would like, and, and I, I've got some research projects coming up that I would like to do, uh, is really uh, empower more parents. Uh, my vision, is that we train parents how to do the basics of this model and then have them take the lead in their own parent teacher conferences to be able to call a teacher and say, okay, you know, it's been four months. Uh, I'm ready to have a solution focused conversation. Here are the, here are the things where I want, you know, we're going to sit down and I want to know, you know, what are the things that you've observed that help me understand that my student, my child here is on track? What will they be doing when they're more on track? Uh, what is it, teacher, that you've been doing that helped make that happen? And how is it that I, as a parent, could also uh, contribute to how, what did I do and what is it that I will be doing even better? Mm. So I think, uh, you know, just to kind of summarize that uh, answer, uh, I honestly believe that, and in fact, in the book, I write about solution-focused schools. Uh, there's a been, there have been some schools that have incorporated the model uh, and trained everyone in the building. And I really think that's a key. I think uh, everyone focusing on the same thing and using the same language uh, can only uh, make things better. I've always said that if you, if you do the solution focused model a little, you'll get a little better results. If you do it a lot, you'll get a lot better results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
Well, so, Aisha, you know about that, don't you? Working with schools and parents and, you know, just trying to join all the dots, really. And it makes such a difference between the school and, and parent relationship. Oh, absolutely. You know, Massive and, difference. And in fact, you know, one of the things that I tell school counselors and teachers is that this is a model that will help flip the script. Mm. Um, and so, you know, we say, well, you know, I can never get a hold of that parent. That parent doesn't want to come to school. They don't want to answer the phone. They don't. And I say to them, well, you know, I don't blame them. I mean, you know, every time we talk to them, it's always about what Johnny did wrong and, you know, what, mm -hmm. what isn't going well. And mm -hmm. so uh, we have to really kind of flip that script and using this model, um, we're going to uh, having more solution focused conversations. Um, I think we're developing partners instead of enemies. Mm. And and we do a lot of um, we, we. I mean, we do what we do work in schools and with groups of young people. And um, obviously, we always ask them what their what their hopes are from from the sessions that we have. And sometimes they're in complete kind of. Um, the school says this is what needs to happen. This is what needs to change for this young person. But the young person says, actually, this is what I'd like to work on. How do you? Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and so you're right. I mean, this is a, it's kind of a co-constructivistic model. So, um, you know, the assumption that Steve DeShazer and Insu Kimber, kind of the founders of the model, really established early on is that the kid is expert in their own lives. Um, however, at the same time, you know, we do bring this professionals. We do bring some you know, judgment and common sense to the table. And so I think that's a little bit of a negotiation. There are some things that are non-negotiable. You got to follow the code of student conduct. Uh, you have to, you know, pass your classes. And so I think it's, um, I, I think what I like to do is I like to start with what the kid wants to do. And that, uh, and then I can always layer in, just like the icing on a cake, what it is the adults want that kid to do. And frankly, it's all related. One behavior is related to the next, whether it's academic or social, emotional, or college and career related, they all have something to do with each other. So it's not hard mm -hmm. to make the leap from, from one goal to the next. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And do you find working with different age, oh, sorry, Joe, do you find working with different age groups? Because obviously, you know, school can be three up to, to 19. I work with 16 to 19 year olds and, uh, um, do you find that you kind of um, you, you differentiate with that approach? I mean, I, I know it's about what what they want, and you start with their hopes. But do you find your style changes? Yeah, absolutely, them? and and I think that's true for any approach. So, and I get that question a lot. You know, can I use this with elementary school kids? Uh, will this work? You know, with with um, with middle schoolers and. And I say, yes, yes, and yes. Um, the approach is not different. How you deliver it changes. And so the way I cheerlead with a high school doesn't sound very much like how I cheerlead an elementary school student. Um, and with an elementary school, uh, school student, uh, just like I would do with any approach, um, sometimes they don't understand the language. They, for example, the miracle question, they don't really quite get that. Uh, and so I would incorporate some of the creative and expressionistic delivery methods. So I might introduce a magic wand or a, fit, a football gridiron in order to do scaling. I'll bring in my props. We'll do puppets. We'll use play. We'll use biblio counseling. Uh, and then, so I write about that in the book. There's a whole section on play, solution-focused play counseling and some learning activities uh, as examples for delivering uh, to very young students the model. Mm. So in your, um, you said you had a grant for four years from 1995, and that, I'm guessing at, at the end of those four years you came up. What um, what pleased you most in those four years? What 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 made you think, you know, what this is yeah. something I need to continue with? Yeah, well, I, I got to tell you, it, you know, this model takes practice. So one of the things I was pleased mm. with was sticking to it, not giving it up, uh, not abandoning it when things weren't quite going as well as I'd hoped. What I ended up realizing was that the model was not hard to do. It was uh, it was difficult sometimes because I was having trouble letting go, um, you know, listening for problems and assuming that I have to understand causes and that kind of stuff. So. Um, knowing that it was doable and, and if you practiced, you were able to get it. Um, I, you know, 
we were wondering uh, at the beginning of that grant, you know, how were we going to put in our 50 hours a week at the university and uh, sometimes more and then spend all day Friday, you know, kind of testing out the kicking the tires of this model. You know, we're going to be exhausted. And to our delight, uh, we were it was actually the opposite. You know, we had we'd kind of gone in tired on Friday morning. But by the end of the day, uh, I mean, I can be honest with you, we went out for chicken wings and beer and we were excited <laughs> to talk about all of the things that we had just experienced. And it was it was really empowering to us. I mean, it mm -hmm. was uh, we were energized by what we were able to accomplish and do um, with all the kids and their parents. I tell some stories in the book about how, uh, you know, uh, some of the some of the skeptical moms and uh, dads and others uh, were, were still in disbelief about, you know, the new Johnny. <laughs> and, and again, you know, as I as I say that, you know, these are good examples, but there's no model that's a panacea. This is not 100 mm. percent. Um, you know, some kids, it works better than others. Uh, I've had one or two kids where they just were not ready for this model. We had to, and, 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 and you know, there's no one thing that typically works. Sometimes you got to incorporate uh, adults. So for example, in the book, uh, I give a, there's a whole section on how to, uh, how to deliver this systematically, how to include parents and teachers at all times uh, by first identifying and really cheerleading that the work they have already done um, and then letting them know kind of downplaying our role so i say to them look you know i know you've been working really hard mom or teacher i know you've been going at this for months or years and it's been some what frustrating but you love this kid and you really want to keep at it um, and, and then i downplay my role i don't know if there's anything i can do that you haven't done already and I say, maybe together, maybe if we work on this together, you know, we can, we can make this happen. And then I, I, I kind of go for the, what I call the bolo. Kid walk into the classroom and usually they curse you out uh, in the first 10 minutes, but this time they waited 20 minutes. I didn't know that. I need to know that's a hundred percent progress, by the way, that's, what I'm gonna, that's the foundation that I'm going to, you know, if they bring their pencil, you know, and, and I, I got pushback from teachers. Well, you know, aren't they supposed to bring their pencil? Yes, but they're not. And so now they are. And that's an improvement. So we got to focus on that. We, we take nothing for granted. So I asked them to kind of be my eyes and ears and then expect them, you know, to uh, kind of let them know that the next time I talk to them, that's going to be what I'm going to ask. What is it that you've noticed that you would say might be a sign of progress? And then when all of that progress happens, they all get credit, you know, and that's one mm. of the lessons that we learned early on. You have to do that because unless they buy into this as a team, they don't understand the results. They frankly don't believe the results and they, mm. they, they don't really, um, and if they don't get some credit for that, uh, they just don't really pay attention too much to those. So, so I, I asked the teacher, I said, you notice Johnny, you know, he waited 20 minutes or he brought his pencil. What did you do to help make that happen? And then I call home, you know, mom, mm. And now mom's getting more calls about, hey, you know, we're noticing some improvement and I want to know what, what it is that you did to help make that happen as well. We really massage and detail and mind map um, the behaviors that each person was responsible for. Mm. Yeah, and then it's, um, it, it's a, a lot of parents um, when they get that text from the school or that phone call, their immediate reaction is, oh, my God, what's what's he or she done now? Right. And it, it must make such a difference for the parents to actually say, you know what? He brought his pencil case in. He had his equipment. And, and that's a start. And, and, and we'll work from there. And it really those, is. Yeah, those small and, changes. And, you know, uh, the other thing, Joe, is that um, – a lot of times, uh, and, and I get it, you know, as educators, especially now uh, in the middle of a pandemic, uh, they say, I don't have time to make these calls and, and I, you know, this kind of stuff. And I think that's still a problem centered mindset. Um, mm -hmm. What I find is that when teachers and school counselors start making those solution focused calls, the calls are more brief. They empower all the individuals involved. And in the long run, those people have uh, more time not dealing with the student uh, and so I see, I see those calls as an investment. It's a long-term investment. Uh, and, and I think the net gain is more time. 
Yeah, definitely. So, I'm really interested in your um, the peer mentoring. So you have a chapter on peer mentoring, and um, I'm not really like to explore with with um, within my setting. And I know as a as a teacher, uh, when you um, when you ask a student to teach what they've just learned to another student, the results are amazing. You know, it kind of just um, enhances <coughs> the learning from both sides. So yeah. how do you find the peer mentoring work? Absolutely, Grant, a great question. You know, um, before I learned Solution Focus, I was actually, uh, that's what I did full time. I taught peer helping uh, six classes at a high school and then I incorporated peer helping as a middle school counselor. And I'm a big believer in peer helping. I think, in fact, that's another underutilized area. Um, I tell school counselors all the time, uh, you know, I can tell one of the other areas that I focus on quite a bit is cyberbullying and digital reputation and helping kids in that area. And, uh, you know, I, I can talk till I'm blue in the face, but if they hear the same exact message from a peer, it carries so much more weight. And mm -hmm. so the question for me all these years, too, has always been how can we capture and use the power of peers, peer influence, um, to have them help each other? And what I found, too, is that the peer helper benefits from that, you know, training and helping others and altruism is also treatment. Yeah. And so uh, somewhere along the lines, I started wondering how can we develop more solution focused peer helper uh, helping. And so in the book, I kind of outline uh, just kind of a range of things, helping kids to learn the basics of this model in order to have more solution focused conversations with each other. Let's start there. Um, mm -hmm. Secondly, it might be even in the course of something like peer tutoring, listening for uh, strengths and resources and opportunities uh, more than focusing on what the kid is doing wrong uh, in the course of their academics. Uh, and then in the book, too, I, I started looking at uh, maybe a new area. I kind of almost propose it, which is solution focused conflict resolution. You know, could we teach kids to as peer mediators to take on more of a solution focused approach? Uh, to mediate conflicts. So all of that, I think, is fair game. And frankly, uh, that's a wide open area. There's just not a lot of research in that area. So um, that part of the book for me was more anecdotal and potential as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in terms of um, families um, in, um, becoming involved and, and I guess it breaks. It it must break down those barriers for for parents who feel that all they ever get is bad news. And when the schools start to say, "Well, actually, you know, this is going quite well. Um, the next sign of improvement would be whatever." Then you're more likely to get them on board. I think so. And you know, we know how important that is. Uh, we talk about uh, kind of a three uh, three legged stool. You, you got to have you got to have school people. You got to have teachers and counselors and administrators. You got to have the kid. Uh, and then you got to have somebody at home and, you know, we, we get them for six, seven hours a day and then someone else gets them for way more time than that. And so uh, those partnerships are very, very critical. Um, unfortunately, I, I think at least in the United States, uh, perhaps where you are as well, I think schools have kind of taken on way more responsibilities than they should, um, especially the in loco parentis, you know, taking on things that perhaps parents should be doing more and letting them off the hook for not doing it. So um, I'm, you know, I tell my school counselor interns all the time, you know, to include the parent, make them responsible for what it is they should be responsible for. Schools cannot do everything. And so at the same time, though, we have to give parents the tools to do that. And so I, I think by helping them learn uh, how to be more solution focused with their own children, how to be a solution focused parent. There's actually, a, mm. uh, I think it was uh, one of my colleagues, Linda Metcalf, that wrote a book called Parenting Towards Solutions. Fantastic book. I've given it to parents who said it's changed their lives. Mm. That's great. Well, I tell you, I'm, I'm really enjoying <laughs> your book. I, um, I, I love the fact that it is a manual and you can just open it up at whatever point, you know, that you that you that you need the relevant kind of section. And um, and I really have got an awful lot out of it. Um, Wonderful. I love that. I like all the um, the step by step guides. Um, and there's so many case studies as well. And I think because I'm, I'm new to the, the, the solution focus approach. 
Um, and what I found was there wasn't enough um, examples of an actual conversation. And so to ha and you've got so much in there um, to ha to see how the conversation might go. Yes, thank you. Uh, and and you know that was that was the goal. Uh, the goal was to come up uh, with uh, a book that was based on a theory, but at the same time was so highly practical. And a lot of people don't know that. You know, a lot of these theories like CBT and REBT and ACT, all this, all these acronyms, um, you know, were developed uh, theoretically first, and then we had to figure out the techniques in order to make it happen. This is a this is a model that was really the other way around. In Sue Kimberg mm -hmm. and and Steve DeShazer and all the people in Milwaukee working on this at, from the very beginning said, let's figure out what we're doing that works and then we'll develop a model around it. And so um, I find the model very, very practical. In fact, it's consistent with my philosophy. Everything I do has to follow the three E's. Uh, as a teacher or a counselor, if I'm working with you, I've got to help you be more effective, efficient and make your job more enjoyable starting now. And if mm -hmm. I can't do that, then I'm really of no value to you. So you're right. We, we came up with lots of step-by-step -step techniques. Uh, what I like about this model is that you don't have to follow things step-by-step. -step. So if you don't like, you know, one, two, three, then do it two, one, three or three, one, two. Mm -hmm. You can mix mm -hmm. things up. You can, it's a very flexible and elegant model. Um, also, you know, just all of the different, um, different all the different transcripts in there are all authentic they're uh, me working with kids and small groups in fact as i'm thinking about it we were just talking about peer helping i tell the story of of uh, going to a middle school and working with one of their after school clubs um, and it was called the gentleman's club and it was really a euphemism because they were, they were not very gentleman like but um so what i noticed right away was that they needed two things. They needed a, a peer helper project that what they were learning was uh, was not really valuable until they were going to teach it to someone else. So we made them peer helpers. Their job was to develop a program, a transition program for the elementary school next door, the, for the fifth graders that were coming to that middle school the next academic year. And then the second thing was I, I wanted to make it solution focused. And so you know, one of the first questions I asked them, even though they were some of the worst behaved kids in that school, um, you know, you're in sixth grade, you've gotten through fifth grade, you've succeeded. And so how did you do it? What did you, how did, what did you do to make that happen? Who noticed? What difference did it make? What, how did it make a difference to them? Amplified it. And so training was treatment as we were helping them develop. So they developed the PowerPoint, they developed uh, learning activities, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, for this transition program all based and what we found too was that as they were doing that because we were being more solution focused their own uh, progress improved they were attending more they were had less discipline referrals teachers were telling us they had more time on task uh, and so we really you know we incorporated the power of the model and the power of peer helping together and it worked out really well mm. yeah i love that section by the way, we, uh, I also worked with uh, the, the girl version of that group. They called themselves the Lovely Ladies, and they weren't very lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I found out very quickly it was a euphemism. It was, uh, that was even more rough. But, but uh, you know, we, uh, we were able to do some of the similar things. Um, for that one, I had to have a teacher present just to help me out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so if we were... Um, if we were the three of us were going, we're going to going to go into a school and say, do you know what, this may be something you want to consider, because um, it's been difficult, Ross. To be honest, it's been difficult to go into different schools and say, actually, maybe focusing on what the child can do rather than what they can't do may be a different way of, of viewing it. Is there still there's still some resistance? Um, how can we persuade them? I mean, I know you're, um, from what you've said, it all sounds fantastic. And, and, and we've seen those results. We've seen those kids where it was almost like they were forgotten or um, there was no chance of them making any changes to make those changes in such a short space of time. But it was yeah. it's persuading because, the hierarchy, I guess. Yeah. It's because they're labelled, aren't they? Some of the children are yeah. labelled without, you know, the star from talk. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 
Well, you know, one of the one of the tricky points of this model, it was, I think it was something Steve DeShazer said, um, if I remember right, uh, and and it's not, it doesn't feel very good to say this to oneself, but um, there is no such thing as resistance. Uh, there's there aren't resistant uh, students; they're only resistant counselors. And so, uh, here, here's here's my thought on that, and that is, uh, you know, once again, this is a model that's going to help us flip the script. Mm. So we don't wait to get their support in order to get the results we need. We get the results we need and then we get their support. And so I always say start small. Uh, even if you're working with two to three kids, sometimes it's a small group of six kids. And then you've got to collect some data. You've got to be able to say, what is the true impact of this on everything that we care about? Social, emotional mindsets and behaviors, academics, uh, college and career readiness and all any of the indicators that we would say, yes, we need more of this. Mm -hmm. And so once we do that with a few, then we start to expand. And, you know, in fact, uh, one of the messages that I give administrators is once I get the evidence and say, look, here's what we have done and here's what we know, we can more kids would benefit if we were able to get to them in a similar way. And so is this consistent with your mission? And if it is, then which child do we leave behind? So you have to decide that. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, if your mission is that we're going to work with these kids and help them, um, how are you deciding which ones we're not going to help? Mm. Oh, that is clever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. I like it. And, and so... You know, one of the other things, too, and I, I, you know, school counselors who I work with know this, uh, you know, we always, you, you can't keep adding to your plate. And so if I'm going to do more work with more kids doing this, I've got to do less of something else. And, and so that's also part of the formula. Um, you know, what are the, what are the things that I'm doing that others could more easily do so that I can do more of what not a lot of other people are doing right now? Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, freeing freeing up that time to 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 focus on. Yeah, um, yeah. What I, what, they, what, I, what I also find too is uh, not only providing evidence in order to gain support, but to really have some su supporters ready to go. Um, so, as you know, in this model, there's no such thing as all or none. You know, somebody says to me, "I get no support for this." I'd say, "Hmm, let's think about that for a second. Um, you know, there's always fluctuations. There's always uh, exceptions in the small. That's one of the hardest things that a lot of new practitioners really struggle with is that all or none thinking. The labels, uh, uh, Isha, you talked about, you know, that uh, some kids are more ADHD some days than others. <laughs> okay? So we've got to focus on that fluctuation. So who is the one teacher? Uh, if you were to go work in her classroom, that could go to the principal and say, you know, wow, this solution-focused person is coming in and here's what I'm noticing among my kids and it's making my life easier. Uh, can she recommend another teacher that you could work with? And now you have two teachers that can support you. And so I think it's really building capacity. It's starting small. It's creating ripple effects mm -hmm. until yeah. you're not asking for support, but they're asking you how it is that they can support you. Mm -hmm. yeah. In other words, it's, it's the solution-focused hypothetical. See, mm. if I were to get all of the support I needed, who would notice? What would they notice? What difference would it make? And then start there, and your miracle mm. will start to come true. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, I have to say, when I was doing my, my um, in fact, it was the last lockdown, so I had all that, that time to, to kind of really <clears throat> um, to learn it, but I wasn't learning on the job because I wasn't really doing the job. I wasn't doing the face-to-face. -face. So I was kind of, you know, um, keeping it all there until the time that, that I, we got back into the classroom. But all I was thinking right from the beginning was, it's it's not gonna work if it's just me. It's This has got to be a training program for the rest of the staff. Otherwise, you know, it's you're only gonna kind of reach one or two people. And so, you know, what you're saying really does um, resonate. Yeah, and that takes time. Um, in fact, uh, you know, as I'm saying all of that, uh, really what I just to make you aware, one of the other 
uh, one of the, the influences on me has been the American School Counselor Association national model for comprehensive school counseling programs. And so this is a, the solution focused method is really well uh, designed to help do just that, not just deliver services, but build a program. Mm. And so, uh, in fact, that's what makes this book unique as well. I, uh, as you saw, uh, that I cut across all aspects of a comprehensive school counseling program, even consulting with teachers. I even talk about uh, starting a beginning teacher support group because one of the things that keeps me up at night is how so many teachers, I think 50% here in the United States, uh, are, uh, are the turnover rate. They're not teaching after five years and half of them leave the profession. Uh, so we've got to find a better way to empower teachers. And I tell the story uh, in the book about how my interns did some morning beginning teacher supports. And before you know it, veteran teachers were showing up saying, hey, I've heard about this group. You guys are talking about what works. Let me tell you, I've been doing this for 25 years. I know a few things about what works. And so I, I think the solution, you know, when you're a solution seeker, it really attracts people rather than <laughs> pushes them away. Yeah. So when, um, what made you write the book, Ross? What, what, was, what were you hoping that people would gain from reading your book? Yeah. Well, Joe, that, that's a great question. You know, I, I've thought about it for a very long time. And um, the reason why I didn't do it was because there were already so many good books on solution focused out there. And I thought, you know, why, why do people need another one? Um, however, uh, probably in the last three to five years, um, more and more, I found myself wishing that the books I were using for my classes or recommending to others were better and different. And so I got to a point where I, I quit wishing and said, all right, I got to make this happen. So the book is unique um, in different ways. One, as you said, it's got lots of authentic stories and transcripts and, and examples. It's got some very practical, I called it the missing manual for a reason. It's got some very practical, time-tested approaches to making things happen. Um, and, and I wrote it specifically for school counselors. You know, a lot of times school counselors have to adopt the language of mental health, and, and it really is a different atmosphere, different environment. And this is the first book that focuses a whole lot more beyond just individual counseling, and it, it focuses on all the aspects of a comprehensive school counseling program. So this is the book that I've been looking for uh, in the last few years, and finally was able to, to write. Well, I'm so pleased you did. <laughs> yeah. and the, other, uh, the, other, the other issue too is, uh, you know, I, I wrote it um, not as a scholarly book, you know, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't trying to please graduate students. I was really focusing mostly on practitioners. I wanted them to be able to pick up this book, whether you're a teacher or a school counselor or mental health counselor, I'm finding uh, those guys are writing me and telling me they're enjoying it as well. Um, but to be able to, again, do something better or different because you read the book. Uh, and mm. it just so happens, it turns out that's what our graduate students want as well. <laughs> so it's not, it's not uh, bogged down by a lot of, you know, theoretical jargon. Um, it's, uh, it's definitely a missing manual. Mm. I, I really like the, um, sorry, Aisha. It's all right. I, I really like the poop lady story. <laughs> it wasn't enough. Oh. There wasn't enough detail in that. Uh, I'm sorry, you, you broke up a little. What, what story? <laughs> there was a story at the end, um, the poop lady. Oh, the, oh gosh, yeah, you're giving away the punchline there. Yeah, the poop lady, I know. Say no more, say no more. Poop lady, poop lady, that's it. Yeah, so I, at the end of the book, I tell one of my favorite, favorite stories uh, about, and actually I was doing a solution-focused workshop for teachers, and this was a teacher. Um, who sat through an entire day not knowing that she was very skeptical. And at the end of the day, she got up and confronted me about how this was going to work with her very specialized kids. These are kids who, who were, um, you know, had some very, very serious needs. Mm -hmm. And she put me on the spot and I was able to get through it. I was able to answer her question and uh, kind of 
for, ran out of there afterwards and forgot about it. <laughs> but uh, she wrote me an email three weeks later, giving me some uh, unexpected praise about how well it worked with her. And, and, and I'll leave you at that. There are more details about it. And she, she referred to herself as the poop lady. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll let you i'll let you read that i won't give it all away so uh, anyone anyone rushing to buy the book um after they watch this fbs chat will be going straight to the back to find yet. the poop lady, <laughs> Don't do that. Poop lady. You'll, you'll enjoy it more if you read the book go from front to cover there. there's a build-up guys so <laughs> it's a build -up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> i forgot about that that's a great story <laughs> oh my gosh and and uh, <clears throat> I'm just, I'm, I, I suppose it's more for you, Grainer, really, because you're um, me and Aisha were in education and are now um, are doing more family work. Uh, Grainer is still in education. I'm just wondering um, how useful the book was for you. What what was it? Uh, that... Yeah, well, I've um, so I, I I work with special educational needs. I'm I'm the coordinator, so um, I'm always looking at interventions and um and now that i've learned the approach it feels like every intervention has to be a solution focused intervention you know even though that's not really expected other interventions are expected but i i'm i just feel that everything every day i'm thinking oh this person needs a bit of solution focus this so um so yeah i've i found i found the book really really useful um just because it's, I can, I can kind of just dip in and out, and uh, um, and just because I'm working with special educational needs, it doesn't mean that um, it's not useful for everyone. I think mm. you know, looking at inclusive education, then you need to be looking much more broadly. Yeah, um, uh, absolutely, and you make two good points. One is, uh, I think this works especially well with uh, when you're working with special needs kids or. Uh, in other cases, you know, kids who are the most uh, dissed, they're disinterested and, and uh, dismissed and, and they're most troublesome um, because they've been through problem centered counseling and they're tired of doing more of the same and having the same result. Mm. So this is a nice way. I, I, I think I even talk about it in the book. You know, there's uh, uh, doing some small group counseling at alternative schools with some really tough kids. And, you know, they, you, you start with the, you know, I tell them. I start with, look, I know you've been through a lot. Um, I know you've had some things you had to get through and you've had many troubles that are, would probably be very interesting if we talked about them, but I'm more interested in how it is they stayed in the game, how it is they're still coming to school. They're not in jail. They're not, you know, do, out doing drugs and, uh, or at least not that I'm aware of, but um, so that, you know, I, that I wanted to focus on what it is that kept them in the game. And they look at you like, are you crazy? No one has really asked you that. <laughs> and so, and it takes them, it takes them a good 15 to 20 minutes to really kind of size you up and say, are you for real? Well, you know, how come we're not doing the regular counseling thing? But once we break through that, they are the ones that respond the best. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, any, any kind of special needs or special situations, uh, I think this is refreshing. For them. And, and the other thing that you said really is so true, dip in and dip out. You know, I write uh, in the first chapter about some of the myths. And one of the myths that a lot of people believe is that you've got to do the whole model for it to work, right? Uh, and it's a huge model. This is, it's one of the things I like about it. A lot of other counseling models are not very clear about the techniques or if one thing's not working, how can I go to a different thing? Um, but this is a model where it's so flexible, you know, you can, you, and I recommend in the book that you start if you're just getting started to start with some solution focused scaling and mm. I give you a four step process on how to do that. And, and you don't even ever really have to focus on goals. If you focus only on exploring progress already made, if you tell me you're at a three, we're going to spend the next 30 or 40 minutes exploring how it is that you're already at a three, especially given all the adversities that you might be experiencing. And then as it turns out, um, you're probably going to think more about one or two things you did that you weren't thinking about because you weren't focused on them. And that's really the basis of this. You know, the, the reason why people have a lot of the problems they have is because that's what they're focused on. Um, you know, we always talk about the cycle of violence. Well, yeah, because we keep focusing on the same thing over and over again. And so, uh, you know, if we get them to shift gears and focus on something else, the assumption is they're going to get more of what 
they focus on. Mm -hmm. um, and so just doing that, just doing some solution focused scaling, exploring progress already made, detail it, mind map it, mind field it, cheerlead it, and reframe when you need to. That's it. That's your start. Don't worry about the rest of the model. You can always add on as you get more experience. Mm. So what's next? <laughs> wow, that's a good one. Um, I always uh, save the best till last. I just jump <laughs> there. Say a few words. Well, I, I I do still have a lot of questions. You know, I wanna I wanna do some research on how it is we can more effectively teach this to parents, how they can take a better lead in their own wor work with teachers and uh, how they can take the lead in in partnerships. Um, I I do want to collect some more data on solution focused conflict resolution. Um, one of the other things that I would love to do is uh, maybe pick a school and and see if we can get the whole school to be more solution focused and learn from that. Great, yeah. <laughs> son. We'll do it. Yeah. We yeah. we because we have such a long waiting list, um, um, Russ. We we've actually started. Um, a four-week workshop for parents, well, families who are on the waiting list, and we invite parents to join, um, where we teach the parents the solution-focused approach and how they can adapt that in their own environment at home. Oh, wonderful. Um, and the peer support, you know, just putting them into breakout rooms to kind of talk about their best types, bringing them back, mm -hmm. and then talking about where they would place themselves on the scales as parents, what they wouldn't change about themselves, blah, blah, blah. It, it works amazing. Yeah. And you yeah. can really start to see the difference. And what we're finding is that actually they're less likely to need further family support. Yeah. 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 It really fosters uh, independence and autonomy. And it, it's an empowerment model, you know, is getting them to do more for themselves. So, so I think we're just getting started. You know, it's, it's been about 25 or 30 years in the making and a little bit longer than that. If we go back to mental health and marriage and family, um, but I feel like we're just getting started. Uh, you know, we've learned a lot and I think we still have a long way to go. Um, I think one of the, uh, one of the books that I would like to put together is maybe, uh, a book on solution focused learning activities. So a teacher or a school counselor, uh, can do more solution focused classroom lessons that meet certain mindsets and behaviors across the board. Um, so they don't have to scramble around looking or, or taking problem-centered activities and trying to make them solution-focused. I, I put a few of those activities in the book already, but I, I could see doing a whole book just mm. on that. Yes, please. Yes. <laughs> well, you guys are doing some fantastic work, and, I, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps because I, I think independently we've been following the same track. How is it that we can empower the whole system, whether it's teachers oh, yeah. and parents and kids, to speak the same language, to focus more, on how it is they're doing things right instead of how they're doing things wrong and then moving them more towards the hypothetical and i always you know i always tell uh, people i work with that language matters i don't ask them uh, what can you do to get to the next level i ask them what will you be doing when you're at the next level you know where there's a will there's a way mm. yeah. oh you've uh -huh. shot yourself in the foot russell what have i done <laughs> Because now you're gonna be you're gonna be one of those. Oh, let me just ask Russell. <laughs> oh, I wonder if Russell can help with this. Oh, Russell, what do you think about this? So you, and, you, and that's okay. Now, you know, I'm, I'm dedicated to this model, so people can write me yes, and email yes, me uh, yes, on the that website. You and, dedicate half a day a week just for oh, me. I'm glad. To have <laughs> but it sounds like you're already doing quite a bit. Um, and like I said, I think um, rather than trying to break through resistance, I think you know, flip the script a little bit, start gaining uh, some, both two things, the data, as well as the collaborators who can, you know, teachers and parents who can vouch for you and, and start building on that. Yeah. I think um, when we have, when we have the parent groups, because often with, with, in the work that we do, the child is very resistant to sit in front of someone and talk about what's been going on and how it's affected everyone. Um, but at least with the parents is the start. And, and you know that saying, you know, if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, you're going to just keep getting the same right. results. So what, yeah. and, and, and it's almost like it's, it's not a support group, more as a training kind of support group in that sense. So if you were to ask your child the best hopes, I don't, accept, I, I don't expect you to sit, 
you know, sit them around the table and say, right, so what are our best hopes? Because they won't. But there's a way you can phrase it, a way you can have that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And, and by the way, I think that's a, you know, I, I think uh, our early founders in this really did focus a lot more on the hypothetical. Insu Kimberg was kind of famous for that. Um, and, and her famous word was suppose. Well, let's suppose things were going mm. better. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I've learned over the years, I think that's great. It's doable. But what I found is that especially kids um, have a better time with this if you don't start with that, but start with exploring progress already made, you know, be able to, to identify how far they really have come, even if they're at a two out of 10, that's 20%. You know, given all that you've been through, you're still at 20%. You're not at the lowest. Even if you were at the lowest, you know, things are fluctuating. Some days you're at a two, some days you're at a one, other days you might be at a four. We're going to focus on your better days. And having the, that conversation really breaks down the resistance. So you can then get to hopes and dreams mm -hmm. and better futures. Um, what I'm also finding is that uh, as more and more parents and others get, get used to this online environment, uh, this model lends itself really well to doing it online because yeah. there's not a lot of huge issues of sensitivity or confidentiality we're not talking about things that would embarrass you or that sensitive. In fact, I get kids, you know, at the end of a meeting say, hey, would you call my mom and tell her what we talked about? Because, you, know, <laughs> uh, you know, this is not the conversations we're having at home. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, in, in groups, you know, doing uh, uh, some solution focused exploration with five or six people incorporating. And I have a whole chapter on that in the book, doing solution focused groups. Well, th those really lend themselves well to the online environment. Mm. Yeah. And, and what we've found as well is that um, particularly in the area of work that we're in, there's, there can be often be a lot of shame and stigma. And so there are they're allowed to join the group without showing their faces, even put another name up. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, we, we, we've spoken to um, who is it? Ash? Galaxy S9. Sparkles. Uh, sparkles. But. The beauty of it is I know that if we'd invited them to our office, they wouldn't have come. They wouldn't have come to a group setting with other people physically in a room. But being able to um, just turn the camera off and be honest and open about yeah. what's going well and what, what needs to change, it, it's, it's, it's been a huge benefit, Yeah, this way of working. Yeah. And, you know, what I find, too, especially in groups, is that one uh, they empower each other. One solution mm -hmm. leads to the next. And so I've got, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kids uh, remembering, oh, you know, I used to do that. And I said, well, you know, so they're starting to discover that some of the issues they're having are issues because they stopped doing that. And so they're reminding each other of ways that they've coped, that they've navigated, that they've achieved. Um, and they're giving each other some new ideas as well. And so that's one of my questions that I like to ask in the group is, you know, what's, uh, what's one thing that you've heard someone else talk about that if, that's helped them, that if you were to start doing it, it would also help you. Mm. Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah. And we yeah, don't yeah. need to write it down, Joe, cause we've got this video. No, cause we've, we've stolen that already. We've stolen right? that. We, we like to steal, we like magpies. We see shiny things. <laughs> And and we use them, um, but yeah, uh, with with that that group cohesion, that um, you know, just knowing that you're not on your own with that. Mm -hmm. that. Actually, it's not just me. Right. Yeah. So, like we talked about earlier, kind of bringing together the power of peer helping and solution focus. I love uh, bringing the power of doing groups and doing solution focus groups together, I find them to be more uh, exciting and powerful than problem centered groups. There's a real skill to it though, isn't there? You know, just kind of holding a group, I think. Um, you know, it's something that I, I'd, I'd love to be able to uh, explore, but I, I mm -hmm. feel like, you know, there's different skills involved. There are, and, and you know, this is why we have, uh, a couple of classes just on group counseling alone in our program as we train counselors um, in the book I did you know knowing that you're right I did cover some of the basics group processes norms stages um, therapeutic factors and that kind of stuff so I did cover that just a little bit just a kind of a reminder 
uh, that there is a group process that you have to follow as well. Um, and, and then you can be solution focused. Mm. So Russ, tell us something about yourself that others may not necessarily know. Oh my. <laughs> oh, let's see. About it's only my, us. Well, you know, here's something. I don't really talk about this. I don't even know if my students know about this. I've always been attracted to empowerment. Um, when I was uh, 14, I discovered the martial art of judo. And the whole idea of judo, is the gentle way, is to be able to not, not, uh, not fight force with force, but to go with the force. And, uh, and so it's a very elegant, sufficient um, martial art. And uh, so I, I think I've always been attracted to this idea of maximum efficiency and minimum effort. <laughs> uh, whether it's a martial art or a counseling approach or being a parent or that kind of stuff. You know, the other area uh, that I spent a lot of time is, is technology. And I I actually, uh, I taught a career class one day, career counseling class one day, and, and um, did a, I volunteered for an activity, a career activity. Uh, and it was, uh, I think it was uh, doing a, um, a genogram or something like that. And actually, um, my students helped me to discover that I did have a theme that cut across all my work, whether it's helping people use technology or overcoming cyberbullying or being more solution focused or using the power of peer helping. Uh, the theme was empowerment, uh, helping people to maximize their productivity and their, um, you know, their, their lives. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I, I discovered that not too long ago. <laughs> I like it. Any last questions, Joe and Grainer? Well, I mean, what can, because um, we've got your website scrolling across the bottom there, Russ. Um, what wonderful pieces of information can we find on your website? Yeah. Um, so the, the website really supports all of that work that I just talked about. Um, I think one of the places that people go to the most is the handouts. <laughs> so if you go to professional development, you click on handouts. Uh, um, you know, for example, in the solution focus section, I've got a 35 page, what I call starter kit. Um, so if you haven't gotten the book yet and you just want your starter kit, it's a bunch of, you know, pieces of it that I put together as a place to start. Um, there's also uh, a bunch of down, you can download a bunch of templates for scaling with young kids, older kids, uh, so that you don't always have to just draw a line and write the numbers one through 10. Mm. Uh, and then there's a PDF of my PowerPoint. Uh, so if I point to an online resource, you can just click on that slide and it'll take you to the online resource uh, uh, where you can download stuff. Mm. Oh, I know. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, too, is I have a Facebook group. So if you, yes. if you search solution focus uh, brief, solution focus school counseling in Facebook, you'll you'll. And this is where uh, mostly school counselors, but others, uh, this is what we do. We talk about the model and how it works and what else we can do. And we share activities and all that. Mm. I'm on it. I'm just going to get the link up. Well, I've got 101 uh, more questions. So <laughs> what I might yeah. do is, uh, is join the Facebook group. <laughs> I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to put it on here. And yeah, if you go to um, schoolcounselor.com and you click on the, uh, the picture of the book, it'll take you to a page where you can find that Facebook group and everything else. Yeah, I've just, I've just posted it on here as well. It, you, you are a true inspiration. I've, oh. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Um, I haven't taken any notes because I'm going to rewatch this. Um, I, I'm, Joe's a note taker. <laughs> because... Yeah. The truth is, even if I take notes, I won't be able to read my own writing. Mm. <laughs> so no, no point. Um, but what amazing work. Absolutely brilliant. And well, so thank you. That means a lot. I really appreciate it. And especially you guys, you know, doing the wonderful work that you do. It's hard work. And I'm glad that mm. the model is making it a little bit easier for you, maybe helping a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, <clears throat> and um, what we've found with all the practitioners that we that we speak to is how giving this this SF community is and 
you're no different. You know, go on my website, download lots of useful uh, fact sheets or information so that um, people can use it straight away rather than waiting and waiting to, you know, uh, be proficient. There's, there's something I can take away from that. Right. And we take away something from everyone that we speak to. Ah, well, and that, that means a lot. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm so pleased that you found the time to talk to us, Russ, because I know uh, you're, a, you're a busy guy. My Don't pleasure. say that because I'm going to email him after this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it, it has been my pleasure. Sincerely, thank you for the invite. It's a pleasure talking to you guys. Uh, and I've watched you interview other people, and I've had a good time watching those as well. So I'm a fan. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> Brenda, any last question or comment? Well, just to say, it's been a real pleasure to be invited on here today, um, particularly to um, to to meet Russ. So, yeah, it's it's, mm -hmm. it's been wonderful. Thank you. All of you. And, and thank you for helping us out, Graina. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah, without you, great. Email, email me your, email me your uh, success stories. I love other people's stories of solution mm. success. So let me know. Mm. All right, email email those for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can do that. We can do that. Right, we've come to. We have definitely come to the end. Um, next week we have John Hendon on uh, next Wednesday, who uh, will be joining us on FBS chat. John is fantastic. Can't wait to. Well, we saw him in Bath a couple of years ago, um, but. Um, you know, there were so many people there, we didn't actually get to have an opportunity to have a good discussion. So we're saving that till next week. But Russ, you are absolutely amazing. Can I just ask that you wait there? Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. Don't, don't, don't touch anything. Okay. <laughs> um, and thank you very much again and see everybody soon.